Hello and welcome everyone to this is my third YouTube video, I am Senor Pingino, and this is the Channel Center's Mayor's Fricus. This video is the third of a series in which I want to show you the Dungeon Bowl mod that I have created for Tabletop Simulator. If you haven't seen the previous ones I recommend you to watch them, because in the first one we saw the basic configuration of the table. In this video and in the second one, which I also recommend, we will go further into different configurable aspects of the board. As I have already mentioned, when I saw that there was no mod for Dungeon Bowl, and as Blood Bowl is a game that I love, I decided to create it myself. With it I have learned how to create games and prototypes in Tabletop Simulator, and I have made this small series of videos to explain you a little bit how it works, how to configure the board, and how to play a game. I hope you like it and find it useful, and if you want to support us, you can do it by subscribing to the channel or inviting us to a coffee with the link you have in the description to Ko-Fi. If you see any mistakes, or if you have any feedback, you can leave me a comment on YouTube and on the Steam Workshop. Also, my English pronunciation is not very good, it's something I'm working on, so the English version of this video will not be voiced by me. Although, in order not to have to record everything twice, in the videos we will use the English version, in Spanish you will find exactly the same options. In this third video we are going to focus on the different elements we have in the player zone. We will start with the dugout, then we will see the tokens, rules and dice, and finally we will position our team logo on the game elements to further customize the experience. Let's start. The first thing we are going to do as usual is to load the mod, and we are going to select a table for two players. As all the players have the same elements, we will see them with this one, but it is applicable to any player. I'm going to take some miniatures, so I can explain everything in a more visual way. What stands most in each of the player zones is undoubtedly the dugout. In the front part, this one that we see here, which is the one that faces the pitch, the three spaces stand out. Firstly, we have the space for the reserves, which is the place where we will place the miniatures that are healthy and ready to go out onto the pitch. It can be easily identified by the arrow symbol above it, and because it does not have any number marked on it. The next space we find is the unconscious space, which is the adjacent one, and where we see the icon of a bruised character as well as the numbers 8 and 9, which are the results of the wound roll. Players who have been knocked unconscious during the game will be placed in this space. Lastly, there is the dead and wounded space, marked with a skull and the numbers 10 to 12, which, like the previous space, are the results of the wound table. In this space will be placed the players who have been badly injured or killed during the match, as well as those who are lost in the trips between the portals. As you can see, it is adjacent to a nice funeral pyre that serves to avoid carrying unnecessary weight in case a player does not make it through the match. The last element that we find in the front part of the dugout is the portal. On this portal we will place the player who is going to go out to the dungeon through one of the portals placed on the board. We simply take the miniature and place it in the portal, before rolling the corresponding die, which we will now see. On the back, the first thing we find is the clock, a button, and several spaces with icons. The Hercules, which is the most obvious thing, is not obligatory, but I personally recommend it, especially in games with more than two players to avoid it taking too long. At the top you can see that it marks 240 seconds, in this case 4 minutes, but if you click on it, you can change this time. Always remember that it is in seconds. I am now going to set it to 2 seconds, and to activate it, we simply turn it around pressing the F key. As you may have heard, the alarm sounds once the time is up, warning the whole table. But what happens if there is a controversial play, or for whatever reason we have to consult the rules, for that we have the button on the other side. Let's turn the clock again, and now click on the button. As you can see, time has stopped. The good thing about this button is that it's not just for our clock, pressing a button stops any clock on the table. I'm going to change the time of this clock to 10 seconds, and I'm going to flip it over. Now I go to the button of player 2, and as you can see I can stop the time of player 1. I am going to change also to 10 seconds the timer of player 2, and now what I am going to do is to flip this timer, and the timer of the first player. I press the button of the first player, and as you can see the two herglasses stop. I press again, and now I press the one of the second player, and the two herglasses pause again. So that's how the timers work. The only thing you have to be careful with is to press only one of the buttons. 
because if you press both buttons, then the first button you press restarts the game. But as soon as they are all resumed it works normally. What we usually do in games is only the player who is in the active turn can pause time. Finally, what remains to see on the dugout are the spaces for the different tokens, these are all set up, so that tokens are centered, making it easier to place them. The first one we find is the space for the apothecary tokens, normally we will have only one apothecary, but in case we have a second one through incentives, we can stack the tokens. In the center we have 8 spaces for re-rolls tokens. Here we can place in line the number of tokens we have in our team. To make it more visual. The space at the end is designed for bribe tokens, just as the apothecary's space is designed to place a token. Although if we play with a goblin team we may need more. So we always have the option of stacking them on top of each other. Now that we've seen all the elements of the dugout. Let's take a look at all these stuff we have underneath. In these three bags, which are the color of each of the players, we will find the different tokens that we will need. In the first bag we will find re-rolls tokens. The three bags are infinite. So we can take from them all the tokens we need. We will take a few. As we said before, the dugout is set up for the tokens to be positioned, so let's put them in place, and as you can see they are arranged in place. Once the token is in place, when we use it in the game, we can flip it over to indicate that it is used, or we can delete it. We will always have the option to take a token out again, in case that we need it. In the second bag we have the apothecary tokens. As in the previous bag we can take out as many as we need. We are going to take out one and place it in its place on the dugout. As you can see it is also positioned in its box, in case we need another one. As we have said, we can stack them. We take out another one and place it on top. And as we can see it also adapts and as many as we need. The last bag has the bribe tokens, as the previous ones are infinite bags, in the same way in the dugout, there is a space for the bribe tokens. We take a bribe token out of the bag and place it in its place on the dugout. These tokens can also be stacked and, as before, to indicate that they are used up we can turn them over, or directly remove from the table. In the player area we also have the rules that we will need to play the game. We have the two rebounding rules and the passing rule. With respect to the rebounding rules, the first one we have is the 8 rebounding rule, which is used when the ball lands on the floor. We also have the rebound rule of 6, which is used when the ball bounces against one of the walls of the dungeon. Finally, we have the passing rule, which is used when we want to throw the ball from one player to another player in our team. These rules can be positioned anywhere on the pitch, in fact, they are designed to pass through objects. The rulers only collide in the center, so they can pass through miniatures, doors and almost anything on the board. Let's see this in a practical way, so let's take some miniatures, we place them on the field, and now we are going to take the rules. We start with the bounce rule of 8, and see how it goes through the miniatures. And so we don't need to move any player to place it. Now we are going to try the Reban rule of 6. As you can see, just like the previous one, it goes through the miniatures, which makes things easier when it comes to play. Finally, let's look at the passing rules, we place them on the board, and we are going to simulate a pass between these two miniatures. We place the rule, and we see that the distance of the pass is short. We would already have the measurement, so all that remains is to roll the dice to determine the results and continue with the game. Now let's move on to this area where we have the dice. At the top the first ones we find are the recognizable tackle dice. These are the classic blood bowl dice with the following faces. Attacker down pushed, both down, unbalanced, and down. We have three of these dice because you know that depending on the strength of the attacker and defender, one, two or three dice are rolled, depending on the case. To roll the dice, and this applies to all of them, there are basically two ways. The first one, we select them, click on them, shake them with the mouse and throw. Or we can select the dice we want to roll and press the letter R on the keyboard so that the dice rotate and show a random face. Doing it one way or the other isn't different, so choose the one you like. Underneath the tackle dice we find two six dices, numbered on all sides, and with the Dungeon Bowl logo on side number six. Something I like about Tabletop Simulator is that, even if the dice fall in a strained way, 
and it is not clear which number has come up. If we place the pointer over them, it shows us the result, which means that we avoid problems, and all the players will always know the result of the roll. With these two dice of six we will make the rolls for agility, pass, armor, wounds, etc. that are so necessary for the game running. This die is the portals die. We will use it when one of our players travels between the different portals. It is a die of six with each face showing the portal with the color we are going to travel. As with the previous dice, if we have doubts about which portal it is, we can place the pointer over the die, and it will show us the portal number. This number corresponds to the number of each of the portals, which makes things much easier, especially if we choose a particularly dark illumination. We also have the eight die, which we will use to determine the direction of the ball bounces, and some very specific actions. The last one is 16 die, which we will mostly use when we have to determine a player randomly. So that is it for dices. Finally, let's look at this element here, which comes with a card. This marker will help us first to know the number of player we are, and as it says on the card, it will also help us if we want to put the logo of our team. The card tells us how to do it, so let's follow the steps. First of all, we will go to the link on the website indicated, from where we can download the template to place our image. We are going to open the web, and as you can see we have several download formats. JPG, PNG, PSD, for Photoshop and TIFF. With all these formats you can use any image editing program to customize the logo. To customize the logo I am going to use the Photoshop template that I have already downloaded. I'm not going to get too complicated, and I'm going to look for a team logo on the internet. Let's see what we get. I'm going to choose this one of the Chicago Bulls. Once we have the logo I go to Photoshop and open the template. As you can see what we have is a reference. I simply paste the image, put it in the lower layer. So that the reference is still visible and center it inside the circle. I scale it a bit if necessary. And if any part is not covered. Like this here. You can either fill it with color, or in my case, I'm going to fill it according to the content. As a tip, leave a little bit of margin with the outside of the circle, otherwise a cut part may come out. Once this is done, we will save the image. It is important to save it in JPG or PNG, which are the formats supported by Tabletop Simulator. With another format it will not work. Go back to Tabletop Simulator and right-click on the player number. Select the custom option and the menu opens. Now click on Diffuse Image, and look for the image on your computer and open it. Important now asks us if we want to upload the image to the cloud or we want it locally. You have to upload it to the cloud, so that other players can see it. Click on Cloud, and select where to upload it. In my case in this folder that I have for testing, don't worry, all these things can be deleted later. Click on Upload and wait for it to load. Now press Import at the bottom and click Update. And the table will load again. and digital necromancy. Now our rules, tokens and bench logos have changed, and the image of our team appears. Magic and as it happens with the painted miniatures, or the RGB of the PCs, if we have a custom logo on our team, we are going to kill much more. This is the end of this third video. I think that all the elements that are part of the player zone have been well explained. There are still some things to explain. I hope it has not been too long, in the next video we will see the part about accessories game that is what we have left. I hope you liked it, if so you can subscribe and help the channel centers mayors fracas, in this adventure that we have started. Any problem, doubt or comment will be appreciated a lot, because the idea is to leave the mod as complete and functional as possible, so that the community can enjoy the game. I would also like include the first expansion, but for now I don't have it, so it's been impossible for me. Remember that this series of videos are my first foray into tutorials and Youtube. don't punish me too hard in the comments, which you can leave me on Youtube and Steam. It's also my little introduction to Tabletop Simulator as a creator, which has been an interesting process. Learning how to make prototypes with this program has given me ideas to make some new projects, and if it works, I will try to show and upload some new stuff. If you want to support us can subscribe to the channel, and if you want to invite us to a coffee you have below a link to Ko-Fi, with part of the funds raised, we want to buy the expansion, and thus be able to update the mod. If you have any doubt about how to make a game and it's within my reach and I can give you a hand, just write and ask, that's all. I hope to see you soon and thank you very much for watching the video until the end. Senor Pinguino bids farewell from the channel center's Mayor's Fricus.